Chapter Three, Part One of the Boy Scout Aviators by George Durston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kangaroo. Picked for Service, Part One. The coming of the police cleared the little crowd of would-be rioters away in no time. There were only three or four of the bobbies, but they were plenty. A smiling sergeant came up to Franklin. More of your Boy Scout work, sir, he said pleasantly. I heard you standing them off. That was very well done. If we can depend on you to help us all over London, we'll have an easier job than we looked for. We saw a whole lot of those fellows piling up against the shop here, said Franklin, so of course we pitched in. We couldn't let anything like that happen. There'll be a lot of it at first, I'm afraid, sir, said the sergeant. Still, it won't last. If all we hear is true, they'll be taking a lot of those young fellows away and giving them some real fighting to do to keep them quiet. Well, we'll help whenever we can, Sergeant, said Franklin. If the inspector thinks it would be a good thing to have the shops that are kept by Germans watched, I'm quite sure it can be arranged. If there's war, I suppose a lot of you policemen will go. We'll supply our share, sir, said the Sergeant. I'm expecting orders any minute. I'm a reservist myself. Coldstream Guard, sir. Congratulations, said Franklin. He spoke a little wistfully. I wonder if they'll let me go. I think I'm old enough. Well, can we help any more here tonight? No, thank you, sir. You've done very well as it is. Pity all the lads don't belong to the Boy Scouts. We'd have less trouble, I'll warrant. I'll just leave a man here to watch the place, but they won't be back. They don't mean any real harm, it's just their spirits, and their being a bit thoughtless, you know. All right, said Franklin. Glad we came along. Good night, Sergeant. Fall in march. There was a cheer from the crowd that had gathered to watch the disturbance as the scouts move away. A hundred yards from the scene of what might have been the tragedy, except for their prompt action, the scouts dispersed. Dick Mercer and Harry Fleming, naturally enough, since they lived so close to one another, went home together. That was quick work, said Harry. Yes, I'm glad we got there, said Dick. Old Dutchy's all right. He doesn't seem like a German. But I think it would be a good thing if they did catch a few of the others and scrag him. No, it wouldn't, said Harry soberly. Don't get to feeling that way, Dick. Suppose you were living in Berlin. You wouldn't want a lot of German roughs to come and destroy your house or shop and handle you that way, would you? It's not the same thing, said Dick stubbornly. They're foreigners. But you'd be a foreigner if you were over there, said Harry with a laugh. I suppose I would, said Dick. I never thought of that. Just the same, I bet Mr. Grenfell was right. London's full of spies. Isn't that an awful idea, Harry? You can't tell who's a spy and who isn't. No, but you can be pretty sure that the man you suspect isn't, suggested Harry sagely. A real spy wouldn't let you find it out very easily. I can see one thing, and that is a whole lot of perfectly harmless people are going to be arrested as spies before the war is very old. If it does come, we don't want to be mixed up in that, Dick, we scouts. If we think a man's doing anything suspicious, we'll have to be very sure before we denounce him, or else we won't be any use. It's better for a few people to be arrested by mistake than to let a spy keep on spying, isn't it? I suppose so, but we don't want to be like the shepherd's boy who used to try to frighten people by saying, Wolf, wolf, when there wasn't any wolf. You know what happened to him. 
When a wolf really did come, no one believed him. We want to look before we leap. I suppose you're right, Harry. Oh, I do hope that we really can be of some use. If I can't go to war, I like to think I had something to do. Then I'd helped when my country needed me. If you feel like that, you'll be able to help, all right, said Harry. I feel that way. Too not that I want to fight. I wouldn't want to do that for any country but my own. But I would like to be able to know that I'd had something to do with all that's going to be done. I think it's fine for you to be like that, said Dick. I think there isn't so much difference between us. After all, even if you are an American and I'm English. Well, here we are again. I'll see you in the morning, I suppose. Righto. I'll come around for you early. Good night. Good night. Neither of them really doubted for a moment that war was coming. It was in the air. The attack on the little shop they had helped to avert was only one of many, although there was no real rioting in London. Such scenes were simply the result of excitement, and no great harm was done anywhere. But the tension of which such attacks were the result of was everywhere. For the next three days there was very little for anyone to do. Everyone was waiting. France and Germany were at war. The news that the Germans had invaded Luxembourg and were crossing the Belgian border. And then on Tuesday night came the final news. England had declared war. For the moment, the news seemed to stun everyone. It had been expected, and still it came as a surprise. But then London rose to the occasion. There was no hysterical cheering and shouting. Everything was quiet. Harry saw a wonderful sight. A whole people aroused and determined. There was no foolish boasting. No one talked of a British general eating his Christmas dinner in Berlin. But even Dick Mercer, excitable and erratic as he had always been, seemed to have undergone a great change. My father is going to the war, he told Harry on Wednesday morning. He spoke very seriously. He was a captain in the Boer War, you know, so he knows something about soldiering. He thinks he'll be taken though he's a little older than most of the men who will go. He'll be an officer, of course. And he says I've got to look after the motor when he's gone. You can do it, too, said Harry, surprised, despite himself, by the change in his chum's manner. You seem older than I now, Dick, and I always thought you were a kid. The potter says we've all got to be men now, said Dick steadily. The mater cried a bit when he said he was going, but I think she must have known all the time he was going. Because when he told us, we were at the breakfast table. She sort of cried a little, and then stopped. I've got everything ready for you, she said. And he looked at her and smiled. So you knew I was going? he asked her. And she nodded her head, and he got up and kissed her. I never saw him do that before. He never did that before. When I was looking on, Dick concluded seriously. I hope he'll come back all right, Dick, said Harry. It's hard, old chap. I wouldn't have him stay home for anything, said Dick fiercely. And I'll do my share. You see if I don't. I don't care what they want me to do. I'll run errands. I'll sleep the floors in the war office so that some men can go to the war. I'll do anything. Somehow Harry realized in that moment how hard it was going to be to beat a country where even the boys felt like that. The change in the usually thoughtless, light-hearted Dick impressed him more than anything else had been able to do with the real meaning of what had come about so suddenly. And he was thankful, too, all at once, that in America the fear and peril of war were so remote. It was glorious, it was thrilling, but it was terrible, too. He wondered how many of the scouts he knew, 
and how many of those in school would lose their fathers or their brothers in the war that was beginning. Truly there is no argument for peace that can compare with war itself. Yet how slowly we learn. End of chapter 3, part 1 Recording by Kangaroo